In part two of this episode, John and I continue the discussion on critical thinking, specifically the intellectual traits. Now, coming back to egocentric thinking again, it is discussed a, a lot in the Paul and Elder books. If we can get past that egocentric thinking, then we can start heading into the down the path of improving our thinking or down the path right. of critical thinking. And I'd like to talk about that a little bit more. What what sure. this egocentric thinking looks like? Again, yeah, a, your frame of reference, your perspective, your experience are somehow you know more significant than others. I, I'll hear you know I was born in small town USA where you know the families were traditional and the politicians were honest, and anything that doesn't look like where I am from or the town that I grew up in is is wrong. To be able to break away from that because it's so comforting. We have this we develop this patina of order of what the world looks like, and to have that order disrupted can be uncomfortable for a lot of people. And if I were to like to develop a, like a Letterman top 10, you might be an egocentric thinker if. We, we could probably come up with a list of some of those things. One would be exaggerating your own abilities and achievements in order to gain recognition, you might be. Mocking others or making fun of others' lack of abilities yet in order to be per perceived as being more talented than others. So really we should come from a mindset of, of wanting to develop others. If kind of get up on your high horse or to feel like you've got your superior to others is also another egocentric point of view. And to try and understand a point of view that others are trying to do the best they can and from, from a more compassionate view than to, to try and prop yourself up based on your abilities compared to somebody else's. This haven't developed yet. There was a time where I wasn't a critical thinker. And even if you asked me today, it's interesting back then I would have probably been more confident. Of course, I'm a critical thinker, but I didn't really understand the full scope of what it was. And now, of course, my response would be a little different. I'm in one of those stages there on page 20, constantly working, trying to improve it. I'm not there yet. It's I think it's a lifelong thing that, that we develop. Another one would be inclination to, uh, to notice facts and evidence that support your beliefs and ignore those that don't. So we count the hits and ignore the misses. That's egocentric thinking. And well, you know, from, from my limited perspective, you see this and you recognize it in your own self. At the end of the day, who am I? Well, I'm a prisoner of my own experience. That's it. I'm a prisoner of my own experience. Where do I start to make sense of the world? Well, I have to draw from my own education, from my own experiences, from what I've read, and from what I've witnessed and what I've experienced. That's, that's it. I'm a prisoner of that. So there's my starting point. So... If you come to me and you say, look, here is a five-step process that's better than John Kotzman's 10-step process, and it's easier, it's less expensive, it's a better use of resources, and it meets all the intent of our mission. Let's try this five-step. If I don't have the wherewithal to let go and say, yes, James, let's, let's try it your way. Well... What's it say about me? I'm kind of stuck in an egocentric loop here, and I'm not growing, and I'm not thinking clearly. I don't want to learn something new. This is the way it is. I believe it. That settles it. Well, that doesn't advance the Army. It doesn't advance the organization. It doesn't advance our mission, and it may impede the mission of soldiers. So that's where John has to step back, get out of his comfort zone, and say, you know what? It's okay for me to step out of my prisoner of my own experience. Let me try. Let me give every benefit of the doubt to James in his approach. And let's see if that works better. There's actually a term for what you just uh, mentioned. It's known as uh, egocentric myopia. Oh. So it's also, it could be called intellectual short-sightedness. And it's based on, on dogmatic views. And when some dogma, dogma, we tend to associate with religion, but it could be anything though that's non, non-falsifiable or, you know, rigid, it's inflexible. And our Thoughts that, you know, this is the model that's always worked. This is the process sure. that's always worked. It will never change it. Why would I change? Why would It's you? not broke. Right. Why would I do that? Wow. That's and, and you're not open to listening things that challenge, you know, th the times have changed. The culture has changed. And if your process your is unfalsifiable, nobody can going to fall under the realm of dogma. That's a problem. Right. Can't advance our agendas if that's the way we think. Yeah, we talked a little bit about uh, egocentric self-righteousness, uh, the delusional sense of superiority over the common masses. That happens a lot, I, especially back in the 90s being uh, over in Europe. You see Americans back then. I think Americans have gotten better, but the, the tendency that, you know what, we're better than everybody else. And that that's egocentric self-righteousness. In fact, I've heard it said before in the past, uh, you know what, maybe we should go to war with that country because... Inside of each of those people, that country is just a little American waiting to break out 
and have democracy spread upon that that is um that's definitely a form of egocentric thinking my sure. foxhole my culture what i is that's the right way that isn't how we should be thinking and i think most of our leaders would agree when we start looking at future conflicts it's it's not about imposing us or you know what what's right for us is right for you it's but, more yeah sure i mean that's that's that gets to the heart of the issue i mean america has a culture the united states army has a culture soldiers have a culture army civilians have a culture when we start to reason you have a starting point and that starting point is your own experiences and it's probably very obviously incorrect if you're going to put your belief system against somebody else's culture or how they do business you know at the end of the day you have to recognize just because something works for us it's not going to work for everyone else and you have to appreciate there are certain things we do in our culture that are just not going to resonate in other cultures, in other geographical parts of the world, within other people. And that's okay. We all, get a, we all must get along on this planet and move forward. But you see people make that same error, and it's not because they're greedy or vicious or anything that's bad. It's just they're not fully understanding. That's probably the wrong standard to put everything against how our culture Right. works. We saw things in Europe that we thought, gosh, that's that's just not right. Well, why isn't it? Why do we believe that? Well, because I'm a prisoner of my own experience and that's what I believe. We saw that in the Middle East. Anywhere we go or deployed to, we see things and we think, gosh, that's just not right. But hold on now. Is that because I'm exercising a little egocentricism there or is there something I could be considering? I think one thing that can help us move past that is to to realize or recognize when we're making decisions based on emotion, usually emotional-based decision-making is probably going to lead to egocentric yeah, problem-solving. Sure. And then to frame problem-solving, one of the things we talk about in the intermediate course is to try and look at the word problem a little bit differently. Usually when we think of problem, it means something's wrong or something needs to be fixed. And it certainly can mm-hmm. be. But when we look at problem-solving, look at it in to the frame of a desired, st- a desired end state. Right. We have a current state and a desired end state. And if we look at it that way, we can start, I think, thinking more critically. It helps enable us to think more critically. And if I can give you an example, I was, you and I earlier were discussing NPR, and I was listening to a, an NPR podcast on a problem, which was a drug addiction. Responding to um, drug addiction with an emotional response, we, we're going to come up with, with courses of action that center around punishing the person, punitive. You do drugs, you're going to be punished. You, you're going to go to jail. Well, when people sure. were able to look at this differently and frame it through, what, what is really our desired end state? Is our desired end state to punish as many people as we can, or is our desired end state truly to try and eliminate drug addiction? And if we're going to look at it that way, then we're going to be more open to more options. And there was a study that was done. It was a really interesting study where they had a rat in a cage and two bottles of water. And one of the bottles of water had heroin in it, and the other one was water. Well, of course, the rat preferred the heroin water until it uh, overdosed. And then somebody asked the question, well, is it just because it's just a rat in a cage with nothing else to do? What if it was in rat paradise, rat playground? Let's, let's build a series of, of things that rats like, tunnels and food and other rats that it can socialize with. And when they did that and they had the two bottles of water, none of the rats consumed the heroin-laced water. They went to the regular water. So there was something else going on. Some countries have taken the information from that study and said, okay, listen, let's take our money that we were, were using toward punitive responses toward incarceration. And let's put that toward getting people back into a community. And so when we start looking at like out of the box thinking or uh, using creative and critical thinking, what is our true desired end state? Our true desired end state is to this. Now it opens me up to more options versus an emotional appeal or emotional response. Uh, You know, if I just punish people with enough sticks, I'll get my way. And what we really want is our healthy, happy, contributing people to society right that's what we want how often have we treated a symptom and not really attacked a problem yep it happens all the time so critical thinking it's an avenue to not go down the wrong path and attack the problem and not not a symptom yeah if every if all the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer every problem looks like a nail right. absolutely and maybe we'll do it in the future episode on the army problem solving process and other ways to frame that. Absolutely. That'd be fantastic.
a lot of, I mean, I think we're starting to creep into the to the realm of uh, sociocentric thinking, which is just as disruptive and non-helpful as egocentric thinking. And that's also in the critical thinking book. You think, uh, you know, most people do not understand the degree to which they have uncritically internalized the dominant prejudices of society and, and culture. Uh, there's a very uncritical tendency to select self-serving positive descriptions of ourselves and negative descriptions of those who think differently from us. And it's not because we have ill intent, it's just we haven't thought about thinking. We have to think about thinking so that we aren't sociocentric. You know, we want the most clear, most accurate thought and products and communication. So that's just another thing we have to be careful for. You have to be careful of sociocentric thinking. Now, really, what is the main difference between egocentric thinking uh, versus sociocentric thinking? Well, I think from, from my limited perspective, egocentric has to do more with what I want. I want to believe something. I don't want to be challenged on my beliefs. And sociocentric thinking is probably more, look, in from my view of society, this is the way we should do things. This is what worked well where I'm from, and everyone should be happy and comply with the way I think, with the way I believe. It's more of a broad spectrum. Like, I have 10 friends that think just like me, therefore, we must be right and you must be incorrect and we need to correct you. It's the wrong approach. It's a failure to realize that you got to think beyond your traditional prejudices in your own culture. And once again, the Army has a culture. Kansas has a culture. California has a culture. We don't have to agree on everything. We just need to know that we're in the realm of legal, moral, ethical, and not violating laws and you know, work together on, on problems and issues. You bring up another point, too. So much, so many of us are comfortable only hearing reaffirming ideas. Sure. So those groups that continue to confirm our beliefs about the world, if we watch only one news source, there, there certainly is bias in, in, in the media. And even if they're not outright lying, it's what they choose it's to focus on. Everybody has their own slant. Yes. It's unavoidable. The thing is, is you might be a critical thinker if you are varying up your news source. Look, look at them all and then paint your own picture versus letting one source give you all your information. The same thing goes with your society, your so friends. True. Go to a source you don't agree with and then run it through your ladder of inference or your critical thinking and challenge your challenge what you believe. Like, my gosh, there might be a point here or, well, how could I look at that? Well, could I research it? Could I question it? What can I do? How could I verify that? You know, run it through critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Improve the quality of your own thinking. I'll even sometimes check up on on fake news outlets just to see what some of the perspectives are out there and to see if I can challenge myself to understand the perspectives of those individuals or those behind that the news source. I think also a, a good exercise in critical thinking is to try to argue the counterpoint to your belief. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so it, you may have a certain position on the Second Amendment. Sure. See if you have the ability to argue the, the counterpoint to what your belief is. And I think that's a good exercise in critical thinking. It's a fantastic exercise. I started at the earliest stages of education, if I could. I mean, when you look at Paul and Elder's book, you know, the standards, all right, how can we start? Well, what are the standards? Universal intellectual standards are clarity accuracy, relevance, logical, breadth, precision, uh, significance, completeness, fairness, depth. I mean, that's where you start. Put it against a universal intellectual standards and uh, apply them to the elements of thought, which are, well, let's look at the purpose. Is the purpose clear? Is the purpose accurate? Look at questions and points of view and information. There's a lot you can do to arrive at the most clear thinking. And at the end of the day, you might find that your beliefs aren't near as different from other people's points of view because you went through a process of critical thinking and you've, you've changed your mind on how you approach some subjects or you have a better appreciation of maybe your opposition or what they're against. And you can be much more influential. Absolutely, because you don't look like a guy who's just wrapped up in egocentric or sociocentric thinking. You're a guy that really cares about 
you know, universal intellectual standards of, of coming to right decisions and just right actions. And kind of the way I look at this book, we have the group of the universal intellectual standards, that clarity, accuracy, precision, the elements of thought, which, you know, the, the purpose, the question at issue, inferences, assumptions. Yeah. I look at those as exercise routines. One is push-ups, one is sit-ups. And the muscles that we're trying to develop over a lifetime are those intellectual traits. That's what we're trying to develop. Those don't come automatically. Those are earned. Those are what we get after applying these over time. And those intellectual traits are intellectual humility. Just having the ability to say, you, you know what? I don't know it all. I don't know. Or I don't want to be the smartest person in the room. I want to surround myself by people who are smarter than I am. Sure. And, and a lot of people aren't comfortable with that. Well, who wants to say, I need to be a lifelong learner? Some people are saying, no, I, I've learned all I'm going to learn. But you have to open up to be a lifelong learner. The book tells us, you know, it's the human mind is naturally egocentric and it's naturally sociocentric. And we develop other intellectual skills. But, you know, the human mind requires the active cultivation of intellectual traits, ethical sensitivities, and many intellectual skills. We can get there, but it's like you say, it's like exercise. You got to practice. You got to slow down your thinking and challenge your stuff yourself as you go along. Another one of those intellectual traits is intellectual autonomy. So having the ability to stand your own ground, to be able to think for yourself, to, to break away from the, the socio-centric influences that uh, you have in your train of thought. And yeah, that takes intellectual courage. Yes. That requires intellectual humility. And, and intellectual courage is another one of the intellectual traits. Do I have the intellectual courage to stand up if something isn't right or to call people out? You know what? That, that is Sure. Easy. When everyone else is on the other side of an issue, it sure would be easier just to go along and get along. The Do bandwagon. It. Yeah. Get on the bandwagon. Get on the bandwagon. You know, group think. You know, you have to fight group think. You have to have that courage to stand up and say, this isn't right and this is why. You have to be willing to stand alone sometimes. And back in hunter-gatherer, you know, primitive societies, it was part of survival to make sure yourself, you know, I'm number one, but then also the group, the tribe that I'm running with, uh, that, that I conform to their norms and their values. So it was in my best interest to survive by going along with the her, the, the group thing, getting on the bandwagon, because to be uh, divergent could mean you're you're kicked out of the village and uh, right. you're, you're on your own. And so the fact that we now live in a complex world, we don't have to worry about that survival is now second to being able to solve complex problems. We need to develop beyond what our, what our monkey brains give us when we're born. Right. Right. Those, those traits served homo sapien well. That's why we're at the top of the food chain. That's why we're here on the planet. And that's why we're thriving. You're right. There's a time where we can now refine our thinking for the progression of mankind. Another one, intellectual empathy. Do I have a true desire to, to want to, to know what other, people's, what other people are feeling, or what they're thinking, what another perspective is? Sure. A, a genuine desire, though, to want to, want to know that. And sometimes it can be really hard. Of course. Who wants to go? You have to go full circle because it is, in the end of the day, self-serving. One planet, we have to probably consider, you know, Without intellectual empathy, uh, things are going to go around and they're going to come around. And it isn't just always for my immediate gratification. I really got to see these other points of view. And that's why it's tough. You had mentioned earlier some of our deployments that we've had over the, the decade of war. And I think you and I have both seen some things that are so against the grain of our cultural, we consider sure. ethical and moral, that could be really repulsive. But if we pause and think and try to have empathy, okay, where do they come from? Why are they doing what they're doing? What really is the true desired end state in this? Is it for me to go kick this person for exhibiting a behavior that I don't agree with? Or is it women having to be covered when they go outside in other countries? And to us, it's just so wrong. Yeah, I saw things that are less egregious, like some of the topics that you cover in a college business class, like when you're doing business in the Middle East and it's not frowned upon, hey, go down to the seaport and grease somebody to get your cargo moved. Yes. That's not a frowned upon. This is a... Another culture, right? And for absolutely. us, it'd be completely un unethical to go to go down and bribe somebody to get the contract sure. through. Absolutely would not fly in our society. But we had help from outside agencies that briefed 
like where I was in Qatar. Um, we had other intelligence agencies explain to the command and our sent, look, this is a common practice. This is a sign of respect when people like us will grease things at the seaport, for lack of a better word, to move cargo. I mean, Arsent established a what we called a slush fund, and we made all legal, and there it is. You know, there will come a point, maybe quarterly, where we need to go down and to be seen shaking hands and paying somebody, you know, $20, $20 equivalent of a Qatari real to someone at the seaport to move cargo. And it's a sign of respect. It's a sign of, I understand you're an important person and you're doing your best here and let me show my appreciation. It's a cultural difference. We would not do that here. We know that's wrong in our culture. That's not necessarily wrong in another culture. And you, we got to watch that we're not quick to criticize others. If we do end up in a place where we have to work with another culture that's very different than ours, uh, it's important to try and understand and have some empathy versus, look, my frame of reference is the right one, because we're probably going to be able to partner with another nation much better the sooner that we can understand their methods of operation, their culture, even if it conflicts with ours, it seems so wrong in some cases, but try to understand where they're coming from. And then again, what at the time and place, what is moral, ethical, legal? Sure. And we should, should not assume that we corner the market on critical thinking. I mean, those same Arabic countries work with us so that, you know, they're not unreasonable. We'll work with you so that you can have your pork products for breakfast. We will work with you so that you can have your Bibles for your study time and your army chaplain. They worked with us. They would compromise, and they would use their critical thinking, and we used ours. And when everything's up front and on the table, it can work out a lot better when we're exercising critical thinking, and we're not getting wrapped up in our egocentricism and our sociocentricism. There's room to work, and we can do things that are clearly legal, moral, ethical, and not against Army regulations. I have a favorite of the intellectual traits. That is confidence and reason. That's confidence that, in the, in the long run, one's own higher interests and those of humankind sure. at large will best be served by giving the freest play those to reason. Ones. Yeah. If Even the example of construction on the freeway, somebody's schema, their mental model, their belief system about how cars should merge into one lane is different than mine. If I can have confidence and reason, it would be less likely that I encounter road rage, get out of my car. And, <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. yeah, good point. Good point. Yeah. We can eliminate a lot of conflict by having confidence and reason. But you get there through practice and re reflective thinking and and slowing down your assumptions and you know just being completely honest with yourself. That's how you get to that point. And the antithesis to confidence and reason would be, you know, distrusting reason or evidence. So mm -hmm. often I'll see people, you know, I don't, that doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand it. Therefore, it's not valid evidence. Sure. And to be, to have the ability to, to look at, to have a healthy dose of skepticism mm -hmm. with information, th to not have a mind that's so open that it accepts everything from every snake oil salesman, but not so closed that you aren't able to, to look at valid information. There's a healthy spectrum of both skepticism Balance. and openness yeah. to where we're able to look and integrate new information. new, And we should be able to change our positions based on newer and better information. Absolutely. Otherwise, you're resorting to dogma, in, which is infallible philosophies. Yeah, absolutely. How often do we think, gosh, we can't move forward with this one course of action because, look, here's a rule or an SOP or a regulation that says we can't. Well, hold on. When was this written? Maybe it wouldn't hurt to ask. Right. Is this still relevant? Can we challenge this? Can we ask for an exception to policy? Is there another way to look at it? Is this really applicable in this theater compared to another theater? Very relevant, very valid questions. It's not to be seen as confrontational. These are good questions of reason that we should all appreciate. And I think the last one is um, intellectual perseverance because there's going to oh, be, yeah. be challenges on the path to being you know, the top tier critical thinker. The opposite would be intellectual laziness, but being able to have, having the consciousness of the need to use intellectual insights and truths in spite of difficulties, obstacles, and frustrations and uh, firm adherence to rational principles. Yeah. It's easy to get worn out when you're the lone person, especially on a point of view 
but you know that's why you can challenge yourself and look at it but that's a tough intellectual trait to to maintain intellectual perseverance because the tendency is all right this is the fourth time i've been told no perhaps i should just give in to what my raider and senior raider want but you have to be you know it goes back to intellectual honesty and intellectual courage you have to persevere you have to Maybe it requires that you put something in a memorandum memorandum for record. Maybe it just requires you to have perseverance and, and just state your opinion and try to do try to be as clear and communicate your message as best possible so other folks better understand where you're coming from. And perseverance is tough. Any other uh, final points? Uh... I just have one final point. If you're a, a fan of Bruce Lee, like I'm a fan of Bruce Lee, he's got some fantastic books, and you know the wisdom of Bruce Lee always prevails. And on the subject of critical thinking, you know Bruce Lee once said, "As you think, you shall become." All right, thank you, John. Thank you. And we welcome your feedback. Please write us at usarmy.lovenworth.tradoc.mbx.amsc-podcast at mail.mail or you can just write us at amscpodcast at gmail.com.